For the longest time, I hadn't found a way to cover or get my thoughts about JRPG news on my channel. I always just felt I didn't have the time I needed to research and form an opinion on things properly. And it wasn't until I covered the recent Zonkey Zero controversy that I remembered how much I actually enjoy covering and looking into recent JRPG news that interests me, and decided to finally find a way to do it. While I'd still like to do bigger videos about news I'm especially interested in like I did for Zonkey Zero, this new series JRPG Quick Takes is where I hope to give quickish thoughts about recent JRPG news topics that I couldn't get to immediately, like the Pokemon Direct or NIS's recent showcase. So with those and more, here are a bunch of recent and kind of recent JRPG news topics and my thoughts on them. I said in my February Direct video that the only thing that presentation was missing was a Pokemon announcement, so when Pokemon got its own Direct at the end of February, I was naturally pretty excited. The announcement introduced the new Pokemon games Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield, and included a look at the new Galar region, along with the general scope of the game with its sprawling map and a bunch of Pokemon. And since Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu was the last Pokemon game I played after a long break from the series, I'd love if this Pokemon game could be the one to introduce me to newer Pokemon and modern Pokemon mechanics. The big talking point for most people were the new starters, featuring the Spritey Fire Bunny Score Bunny, the mischievous Grass Chimp Grookey, and the timid Water Lizard Sobble, with that last one having the kind of adorable anxiousness that has already captured the hearts of many. As for me, I'm leaning towards Grookey at the moment as I love the sound of having a mischievous Pokemon and for some reason seems to be drawn to grass types in Pokemon games, but Sobble also appeals to the part of me that loves Crystar, so I could be swayed when evolutions come out. I'd love to know what starter Pokemon everyone is leaning towards right now, and also if you're leaning more towards picking up Pokemon Sword or Pokemon Shield. I'll definitely wait until the Pokemon for each one are announced to make my final decision, but on name alone, I'd probably choose Sword since whether it's in Kingdom Hearts, tactical JRPGs, or other games that let you choose your weapon type in some way, I've never picked Shield for any of those. But if there was some good Pokemon in that edition, I wouldn't mind trying it, so hopefully we'll get some new information soon. While the Octopath team announced that a new game for home consoles will take a little longer, they at least offered something to tide players over in the meantime in the form of their upcoming smartphone game titled Octopath Traveler Champions of the Continent. Champions of the Continent describes itself as a single play RPG, which makes it sound like it may be different to most smartphone games that encourage you to play indefinitely, in a way that sounds like it would match the original Octopath Traveler's storytelling style more. In the game, you're said to be traveling austere to fight against three different different evil bosses that have amassed fortune, power, and fame respectively. And throughout this journey, mechanics from and inspired by the original Octopath Traveler game will be available, including field commands such as steal and hire, and also its turn-based battle system with its break mechanics, but this time with an 8-character party. Since it's kind of a prequel for the original Octopath Traveler and the gameplay looks faithful to the original, I'd be interested to try it to see how deep its story is, as I love smartphone games that feature a decent story and seeing the pictures of its bosses in Famitsu got me pretty excited to try the experience. I was fully intending to check out Champions of the Continent and even was going to apply to get an early demo when applications open on March 12th, but the specs for it require an iPhone 7 or up and my phone is just not that new. So while it seems I won't be able to check it out until I upgrade my phone, I do find the fact that it's running on a more powerful phone encouraging as I hope that it means its quality is similar to the original Switch game. And since it looks interesting. I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts about it when it comes out. Speaking of Square Enix, in November of last year, there was an oddly toned livestream for Final Fantasy XV's second anniversary that was expected to be a happy and momentous occasion of new announcements for the game's upcoming DLC. It was certainly noteworthy, as it revealed that Hajime Tabata had left Square Enix, and three out of four of the Final Fantasy DLCs announced were cancelled, with the upcoming episode Arden being the only one remaining. Months later, and Square Enix have dropped on YouTube the episode Arden prologue video a 15 minute long animation detailing Arden's past and events of the world of Eos's history. My interest in this was kinda low as it's been a long time since I've touched 15 at all, but I decided to watch it so I could talk about it and concluded that it's fine. I'd even go as far to say it was good, but unfortunately, it's just a bit too late. The prologue showed some events that gave a look into a warmer side of Arden as promised, and I even liked the look of 
the gameplay trailer after that showed what looked like playable versions of scenes from Kingslave that I thought was pretty cool. However, being over a year since Final Fantasy XV had a DLC entry, since the previous DLC episode Ignis was released on December 17th of 2017, with episode Arden coming out on the already crowded release date of March 26th this year, even though I was one of the people who enjoyed Final Fantasy XV a lot, my motivation to play just isn't there right now because it's been so long. As someone who was a really big fan of this game when it first came out, I can appreciate that this is being made for other fans of the game, and I'm sure there are a few diehard fans who will enjoy this, but for me personally, it's just a little too late right now, so if I do get to it, it'll be whenever I have some free time, unlike the way I used to rush to buy each of the other character DLCs, which is a little sad. In happier news, at the beginning of last week, NIS America held a livestream that detailed some of their upcoming games for 2019. Some of the games talked about had already been announced, such as the Caligula Effect Overdose, but the great thing about this conference was that we were able to hear from many Japanese developers and people involved in making the games to get a deeper insight into what they'll be. And hearing things like the producer of Caligula talk about how the game reflects modern day Japan, and the CEO of Falcom detailing Trails of Cold Steel 3 as the next arc in the series got me more excited for what those games will be. I had wanted to make a full video about the conference, but I was working on my Death End Request review at the time. But if I did, I would have listed my five favorite games from the event, which were The Caligula Effect, Overdose, The Princess Guide, which I didn't realize was called that in English, as I actually had the Japanese version floating around somewhere, Trails of Cold Steel 3, which I was happy to hear is somewhat newcomer friendly, Alliance Alive HDR, which I really hope I get to play, and the adorable Horrible looking Destiny Connect. I'm excited about all those titles, but the one I was most keen for was Destiny Connect, as I thought it looked the most interesting. I had really wanted it to get localized when it was shown in the Japanese version of Direct, so I'm glad to hear that it's actually happening, and I hope that its story with a time traveling theme, as as good as its picturesque animation style, makes it look. By the time this is up, it should be a few days after Atelier Lelua's Japanese release date, and just before it came out, the game was getting decently hyped up in Japan, with Atelier's Japanese Twitter doing a fun Q&A, and also Japanese gaming magazine Famitsu doing a live stream with the game's character designer Mel Kishida, and the voice actors for the shop assistant sisters Risa and Refle. The Atelier Twitter Q&A mostly reiterated things that have already been said about the game. Unlike the old Arlen game, there will be no time limit, and characters from the original Arlen game will be in the story, which they chose to leave a little mystery with as they said we'd have to wait until the game to find out Rorona, Totori, and Maru's ages in Lulua. They did reveal two small things though, one being that several character endings have been prepared for the game in the spirit of the original Arlen series, and also that Stirk will indeed get another special epic attack, which the picture has me very excited for. Speaking of special attacks, in Famitsu's livestream, some of the late game battle system was shown including a few special attacks from newer characters, and also some of the more developed system. I noticed while playing the demo again and from watching the stream that the system from Atelier Lydian Soul, where you can have a partner doing an assist attack if triggered, seems to be in place when you add support members to stand behind your front party members, and this seems to be alive and well in Lalua as well, with the five people party meeting having two support people waiting in the back for everyone, seeing multiple assist attacks trigger sometimes, dealing some serious damage and looking very cool. The area they explored in the stream was also one I remember from Arona and Totori, which was exciting to see. And they even showed some of the breadth of the map, including the distance from Arlen to Arcalis, which looks pretty far, with plenty of familiar places sprinkled in between. So while I was already excited for Lulua's release, there seems to be a lot to look forward to and a lot to play with, especially for those like me who are big fans of the Arlen series or have it fresh in mind from the Arlen Deluxe Pack. As for more things to look forward to, a few release dates were dropped recently for a couple of games I've been interested in. The first being that a PC version has been scheduled for spring for Death End Request that I recently reviewed for PS4, which will be good as more people will be able to play it since it was previously a PS4 exclusive. Next is Dragonstar Varnir, which looked great when I played its first chapter and has now been given a release date of summer this year. So as long as it comes out at a good time, I would definitely like to play this one thanks to its interesting looking multi battle system, especially since I enjoyed Eider Factory and Kompa Hearts battle systems in Death End Request so much, which gives me hope for Varnir since they made that too. 
As a final topic, one of you asked in the comments if I could cover. Sega's upcoming game, Judgment, has been out in Japan since December of last year, however was recently pulled from Japanese shelves as it came out one of its actors, Pia Taki, tested positive for cocaine use and was arrested. When I first heard this news, while it's crazy to hear of any game getting pulled from shelves, I wasn't overly surprised as Japan is very strict about drugs and as I was reading up about it, I noticed they had a similar occurrence in Yakuza 4 where they recast a character due to tabloids accusing him of cocaine use as well, so it wouldn't be surprising to hear something similar being announced for Judgment. With its English website still up, Judgment is still supposed to come out in English at this point, but whether the game's release in both the West and when it's back out in Japan will still feature Pia Taki is hard to tell. Not knowing Pierre Taki as an actor well means I don't really have a huge opinion on this, but it would be a massive bummer to see anyone's hard work into portraying a character be removed from a game, so I hope in any case everyone is still able to get this game regardless, as the team who created it do great work, and this controversy won't affect that. While I won't be picking up one of the expensive Japanese copies of Judgment floating around online, I will be keeping the demo I have for it on PS4 as long as I can so I can see this game in at least a little of its original form sometime just out of curiosity, and I hope that we can all still look forward to seeing the full game in June as well. Thank you for watching this video, let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are on all these topics, what topics you'd like me to cover next time, and what you think of this new video format. You can like and share this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to my channel for more JRPG content like this, and ring that bell to get notifications on whenever I post so you don't miss a thing. You can check out more videos here, and you can also find me on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at JRPG Jungle. Those links will be in the description below, along with links to sources and all the games I mentioned in this video. Until next time, thank you, bye!